So right sizing, let's talk right sizing. I'm your host, Ann Rossley. I've been selling residential real estate for 30 years in Chicago. And in 2018, my husband, Tom and I did our own downsizing experience. We went from our old traditional four square vintage home in historic Liquid Belmoral to the Cultural Mile, which is Michigan Avenue across from the Art Institute. So uh, I have personal experience in the whole downsizing thing. But beyond that, I've helped many people right size and I have um, gotten the Senior Real Estate Specialist designation, which gives me not only training, but also resources to help my clients buy and sell. Now, when I put this webinar together, I reached out to the top producer at Key Mortgage, Ron Haddad. Ron has been there for over 15 years, helping hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people get their mortgages. And so we're very, very grateful to have Ron with us. And you have a particular interest in right sizing too, right, Ron? I do, Ann, and thank you, uh, thank you for uh, having me. You know, I work with uh, several financial planners, estate planners, um, real estate attorneys, you know, a lot of this does fit within right sizing for uh, whether it be retirement, you know, or just uh, just good mortgage planning or family size planning, we'll call it. Um, and it could include many things. You know, it could be that second home, that end home, that vacation home. There could be a lot that's involved with it. So I have a lot of experience and uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to contributing to this uh, right sizing webinar. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. So right sizing uh, is the new downsizing. Today we see the tiny house movement catching fire. We see the Huga movement of minimalist living. We see the popularity of the Kanmari method. That's where Marie Kondo says, hold up this whatever and see if it sparks joy and if it sparks joy keep it and if it doesn't let it go so one thing that we wanted to talk to you about tonight is is your home sparking joy and if it's not that might be a sign that it's time to right size today we're going to talk about who's right sizing why they're right sizing where they're going and then we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of it. And Ron's going to really help us work through how to deal with the financing aspects of right-sizing your property because financing is the key to it all. Who's downsizing? So yes, the traditional seniors moving into senior centers, yes, that's downsizing. But there's also the boomers, 50 to 75, whose children are grown, they find that they have an oversupply of space and they're ready for a new and fresh lifestyle. And then of course, Gen Xers and millennials are embracing the uh, smaller footprint and just the minimalist lifestyle. So I keep moving on that, I apologize. Homes.com did a survey on why people are downsizing, and they use the term downsizing, not right-sizing. The number one reason is saving money. Millennials were 20% more likely to downsize for money reason as boomers, and 23% of boomers downsized after their children moved out, no surprise, citing a surplus of space and ease of maintenance. On average, and I loved this fact, parents waited five years after their children moved out of the house before they downsized. And the consensus is 24 years old is the age at which you can get rid of your kids' things. I love that little fact. And I'm looking across at my daughter. She's got one more year and then it's gone. All right. The most difficult adjustment to downsizing is having less space, not a surprise, and less privacy and being farther away from family and friends. And I suspect that family and friends one is for those people who are moving to the sunnier climates because they're leaving their family to go far away. So I'm finding more and more people are aging in place and staying near their family. And that segues into 57% of people downsized to a location based on their adult children. They wanted to be near grandchildren and keeping the family together. And 93% thought it was important to buy a home that had enough space for one child to be there overnight. All right, so let's sum it up. Basically, why do you consider uh, right-sizing? To save money, to save effort, 
invest the difference. And by this, what I mean is you take the equity out of your home. And what you do is you either put it in retirement, you might buy a second home, you might pay for your adult child's education or a myriad of options. But that's what we mean by investing the difference. Of course, downsizing or right-sizing helps you simplify and it helps the environment. All right, where are people going? This is the mobility map from the census. And I love this map. It's not surprising, but it's fun to see that generally people leaving Chicago, and that's what this is, they're going to the sunnier climates or they're going to the metro other metropolitan areas. And uh, Katie Hill from Market Watch was posed this question. I thought it was fun. Someone wrote in and said, I'm in Chicago. I love Chicago. I want somewhere like Chicago, but I want it to be sunnier and warmer. I have $10,000 a month to spend. Where should I go? Katie told them they should go to either Tucson or Savannah. Now, I would be remiss. Oh, let me tell you one more thing. People leaving Chicago, the biggest exodus from Chicago is going to our collar counties. So sometimes people aren't going far away, they're going nearby. And this is where I say, I would be remiss if I didn't show you this situation. Beard and Warner is part of leading real estate companies of the world. That means that we are one of many specific companies that have 550 firms, 135 associates, all connected with the top firms in our market area. And wow, that slide is just expanding. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> anyway, I'm going to forward beyond that. Um, the point is, when you have somewhere you're thinking about going, maybe you want to go to somewhere southern, but you don't know if you want to go to Florida, Arizona, South Carolina, Georgia, and you just like to take a few trips and figure it out, we can help you find the right people in all those areas. And there's actually a search function with leading real estate companies in the world where you can go on and just surf. I go to the Luxury Summit and Leading RE Conference every year and I've met some fabulous people from all across, across the globe. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Okay, that was outbound. Let's talk inbound. So there are people, believe it or not, who really are looking forward to retiring in Chicago. And in terms of people moving in, surprise, they're coming from the Collar Counties again. So this is... in large part because of our empty nesters who decided, okay, raise the kids in the suburb, now I'm ready to come downtown and enjoy city life. So, Josephine Bernero, she advocates retiring in Chicago. Now, tax breaks, ah, no, there really are tax breaks for seniors. Senior property tax exemptions, there are retirement income benefits in the state of Illinois that are actually known as being good. Cost of living is actually moderate compared to places like New York City. If you hate the heat, we've got an unbeatable climate. We're centrally located and there's lots to do. All right, now let's get into the meat of the program here. So you decided you're ready to make the move. You have an idea where you want to go. Now it's time to make it happen. You want to move into the buy-sell phase. Very simply put, you have three choices. You can sell and buy at the same time. You can sell first or you can buy first. So let's look at each. All right. This is the simultaneous buy-sell scenario. In this scenario, you're going to, the point of this is, you're going to close at the same time. Where you close in the morning on the home you're selling, you close in the afternoon on the home you're going to move into. And the other stuff happens beforehand. This is the perfect thing for people who want to minimize their risk because they want to close on time, but they still need to take the equity out of their old home to put it into the new. So it's at this point, I want Ron to jump in and talk to us a little bit about the pre-approval and like where you fit into this scenario in our little honeycomb time grid. Absolutely, and you know, I like to refer to this more as the traditional way of 
selling and buying, taking the equity from your home sale uh, in the morning and sending it over to the purchase for your, your afternoon closing of the same day. Um, that balance, I think it's the, the traditional way of approaching it. Although, you know, balance isn't always, it's not always there, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, you know, ideally, you know, I think you should always want to know what your options are before you sell or even start dipping your toe into buying or looking around to buy with getting pre-approved if you need a mortgage. Um, there's a couple of things that you want to go through, which I kind of refer to as checkups. You know, when you're buying or selling and buying, of course, right, you want to get a mortgage checkup just to make sure everything's in order. You know, you'd be surprised how often I'll see just something um, minor on a credit report, a $50 copay from a dentist that nobody knew about 10 years ago that's just keeping the credit score a little bit down. Um, also, uh, making sure affordability is a good fit. Before you put your home up for sale, make sure that you are eligible to, on paper, of course, uh, for loan approval. Uh, and then also, too, with the selling aspect of it, especially if you uh, own a townhome or a condominium, um, they do offer service to have a checkup of the association. Uh, especially uh, today, there's a, a lot of, uh, you know, there's special assessments. There are, you know, sometimes pending uh, litigation, things that could hinder someone buying uh, with, with a loan. You would want to know about that up front before you really get involved. I offer that service. And, and you know, of course, I know you're part of that as well. But these are all just, you know, making sure that the house is in order before you put the house up or try to buy the next one. Right. That's a really great service. Uh, so during this buy sell phase, there are some concerns, if you will. Um, I'm going to go back here. Um, when you do this, you want to, um, here, let's share up again. Thanks everybody for hanging with me. Techno is not my thing. There we go. Okay. There's a ton of uncertainty between when you commit to the new home, but you haven't closed on the old one. So you know you're, you know, you're going to buy, you may even have a contract on your home, but you need to make sure that that buyer gets to the closing table so you have the equity to close. So one of the ways we handle this is with the home sale contingency. And that will minimize risk for you. What it basically means is you put a contingency in your purchase contract that says, Mr. Seller, if my own home doesn't close, you're gonna let me out of this and I'm gonna get my earnest money back. And it's a fabulous protection for you. As you would imagine, if we're in a hot buyer's market, did I say that right? In a seller's market where all the buyers are vying for property, um, it hurts you from a negotiating standpoint because that seller is gonna want the cleanest contract possible, cash buyer, no contingencies, or at least a pre-approved buyer who doesn't have a home to sell. So once we layer in that, home sale contingency, it does protect you, but you have a little less negotiating room. So that's something we're going to want to talk about uh, as we go. Um, any other comments on that, Ron, that you want to yeah, share? Yeah, you know, a part of the, the process and why I always suggest getting pre-approved for mortgage financing sooner than later is to know what your options are for that ideal traditional buy and sell than buy. But also, you know, we're in uncertain times today. You know, the domino effect. Let's say you do identify a buyer for your home and uh, you identify your next home, you enter into a contract, it's contingent upon your home sale. But what if something happens to that buyer? What if COVID-19 world that, you know, the effect that we're in right, right now, you know, Let's look into what plan B and plan C is, just in case. And mm -hmm. that, again, I think just, it, it favors, um, and it obviously it favors the, the well-prepared and also eliminates potential frustrations and risks if need be. 
So again, the sooner the better of just making sure your ducks are in a row. That's it. All right. Have you ever had it happen where you get to the closing table and everybody thinks everything's good to go and then boom, the morning closing didn't occur, so the afternoon closing can't occur. What do you do in a case like that, heaven forbid? It just happened a couple of weeks ago. If you recall, you know, all that water, all that rain we got. We had a, I had a, uh, my customer who was selling in the morning and buying and uh, they had already moved out. And um, this actually happened a couple of times in my career where there was water in the final walkthrough, a few inches of water. So we had to work with the attorneys and restructure things. And uh, we were still uh, able to close the same day, but there was some you know, last minute restructuring. A few years ago, I had a situation where my client, for whatever reasons, decided to turn the power off on the home a few days. And we were all like, oh, just, you know, that's something that probably shouldn't have been done. So that was a little bit deeper. That was a lot more water than just a, a little bit of seepage. Uh, that was the, the sub pump entirely off. So it does happen. Things, right. things happen. The point being, though, that things can happen, get ready, but we can pretty much work through them if we right. need to. There's, I think that just comes with experience, you know, uh, seeing obstacles and knowing how to overcome them. Uh, working, you know, with situations, not trying to punch a hole through it, just, you know, when things occur and they pop up, having your plan B and plan C, and also having a great team on your side. A lot of the, the situation that happened a couple of weeks ago, you know, the attorneys were top notch. Uh, so the, also having that right legal representation, it's, it's a big part of having that team working, um, working together. Right. Okay. Um, what percent do you think of your transactions where they're buying and selling? Do they close in the same day? Quite a bit, quite a bit. You know, um, a few years back, I think technology has really helped quite a bit with this. And what I mean by technology, especially wires and money moving through the Federal Reserve years ago, 10, 15 years ago, you could send a wire at nine o'clock in the morning. It may not show up until three in the afternoon. I Today it takes 15 too. or 20 minutes. So that's really allowed us to, to move things along with these same day back-to-back -back closings. Um, you know, ideally, you know, people do want to try to move things into the home and out, you know, just to, to make it easier for their move. It's not always perfect, but uh, it is negotiated quite a bit to have the same day closing. I don't know if I could put a percentage on the top of my head, but uh, there are quite a bit more today than there were 10, 15 years ago for certain. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, I wanted to mention a rare contingency. We just talked about the sailor closing contingency, and this is one that I have done from time to time, and I'm currently working with a client who's dealing with this, and that is what I call, I don't know what everybody else calls it, but I call it the reverse contingency. And that's in the situation where maybe somebody's in a home that uh, they know is gonna sell right away, but they're more concerned about finding the new home and because maybe there's not a lot of inventory, which is our case today where we don't have a lot of inventory and they still want to end up with that concurrent buy and sale. So I, what I've done sometimes is put this contingency on that the buyer who's buying my client's home has to be willing to wait a week or two to confirm that the seller has a place to land before we can move into the inspection and attorney approval period and then move on to the closing. So uh, just to let, you know, people watching know there is a way to, if you're nervous about getting out of your house and finding the right property, we can still do that. Uh, no contingency. Ron, tell us, how many, you, okay. A lot now, yeah. Three years ago when it was crazy and we had, you know, four and five offers at a time on a property, there was no way you could buy a property with a sale contingency, right? That's true. And, you know, today, and again, when I say today, this is May 2020, right? Now the contingency also, we're, I'm starting to see a lot of pushback for sale contingencies. But I think that's more out of, you know, the current fears and situations, right? Because of these domino effects, because of people, God forbid, losing their job. And, you know, mm -hmm. so I think that will kind of thin out a bit. But, uh, you know, there, it's all about the market. It depends upon what side. Is it a buyer's market or a seller's market? Um, but if you're up against competition, 
and it's a real nice property and you're up against you know three or four other offers and three of them don't have a sale contingency and you do even though you may be offering more money that you may not necessarily be the most attractive offer so in some cases again knowing if you have options to potentially lift a sale contingency um maybe you had mentioned something in about you know having um, a sale contingency but then with like a i don't want to say a kick out clause but trying to get the home under contract within 30 days but if it doesn't happen, if it just doesn't come or transpire or manifest, then they can lift the contingency and still purchase without having to sell. That's that was that's interesting, um, and it's all I think the art of negotiations and the art of the deal and working it out. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, um, let's move on. Let's talk about. Let's share my screen and see if it works this time, everybody. There we go. All right, let's talk about the next option. And that's selling first. This is the least risky option for when you wanna make the move because you're able to get the property sold, you get your cash in hand, and you know exactly what you have before you move forward. But of course the downside is you've got this period, whoops, fancy fingers. You see on the bottom there, interim housing or lease back from seller. So you've closed and there's some period of time until you close again and you're gonna be homeless unless you rent back or you go to some kind of interim housing situation, move in with the parents, something. Anyway, um, but, but that's for people who are really looking for um, what they want there. Ron, do you have anything you wanna say about this scenario in particular? No, you know, so in my, not everybody wants to move twice, right? You know, to interim. Um, but actually having the opportunity to sell and then rent back from the buyers you just sold to for six months or so gives you a lot of time and freedom and, um, you know, the ability to, to, to search, negotiate, perform your due diligence and not feel pressured that you have to sell in order to buy. But, yeah. um, you know, again, it's all about that balance. So, um, it's, uh, it's something that, could also result like like we're talking what if you don't identify do you really now feel like okay um, I haven't identified my home are you now being forced to settle right because your your lease is whatever so it, right. it's yeah there's there's some risks with it though there are some risks the other day you were mentioning to me that some people particularly maybe at retirement age say, okay, it's time to retire. They sell their home. They're ready to go to the new home, but there are different pre-qualifications oh, yeah. because they aren't at that same income level. Can you talk a little bit about that? It, I, the one thing that you will always hear me say is get pre-approved early. Make sure you are working with, you know, a true mortgage advisor, a mortgage planner, not just, a, you know, an 800 number loan officer that says, come back when you're under contract. Make sure that you're working with someone that understands what your plan is, because your plan could be, well, you know what, if the loan officer asked me how much I make, I told him how much I make, but the loan officer didn't ask me the question, if I'm retiring or taking on a new job or looking to, to move into another role that would impact- or start a new business. Start a new business. <laughs> or how about this, selling my business. I'm, yeah. I just sold my business and you know I'm going to be on- a contract or switching over from a W-2 wage earner to a 1099 contractor, all these things that could impact affordability and to the detriment, unfortunately, later on for mortgage approval. So having dialogue, working with an advisor is absolutely crucial, especially if you're going into retirement because you would be going from your, your income that you've been earning for years, let's say, to now you know a transition. And you may not want to mm -hmm. make the transition over to fixed income yet. You may want to hold off a little bit. You may want to maybe make take a lump sum or push off in an annuity or not necessarily start a draw from a 401k. Now, we need in lending today some form of income to approve someone for a mortgage. There are some great programs for asset depletion. We add up all the money that you got pretty much in investments and we go through a calculation to back into something that can be used for qualifying purposes. 
but that takes a quite a bit amount of money in some circumstances. In other situations, it's not even an option. So again, dialogue, pre-approval, communication, mm -hmm. professional, and that's the only way to continue, especially if you're looking to transit, uh, trans, uh, move from the um, working world into your retirement and, and, and good days to come. Right. That makes good sense. I just want to add one other comment here too. And this is more for people outside of my market area, but I had a situation where clients came to me and said, Oh, we're ready to buy in the city. We're listing with so-and-so because she just swears we can get this price for our house and bless their hearts. They gave it to this agent put it on at this high price and it was on a far suburb where we you know hear all these stories of people not being able to sell their homes maybe for what they bought them for 20 years ago and it got nowhere and so again it's important to like step through the whole process mm -hmm. before you move forward so all right now We've talked financing considerations when you sell first. Let's talk about buying first. If you buy first, I would say this option is the, the right option for somebody who is looking for the perfect home and have the, they have the financing capabilities to make it happen. Uh, if there is a particular type of property, let's say you want to be uh, overlooking Millennium Park and the lakefront, and there are only certain buildings and certain tiers you want to live in if you're making this home move to a home that sparks joy, right? So you decide you want to buy first, and then you're willing to carry two loans for some bit of time, and that's really the con or the downside of this option. Um, Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's that's the third one. So what do you have to say about that one, Ron? This so this this scenario is the most common today that I have seen. You know, really? It be, oh, it, it it is. Well, for multiple reasons, because it does stretch across multiple scenarios and situations. Okay. The the family right now. I mean, again, we're in this this environment where um, let's say you are in a, in a condo and you are. Um, uh, again, this is more right sizing. You're in a condominium. You just had a little one four months ago. You got to move out, but you can't necessarily have anyone coming in because of what's going on right now. With right? the COVID, sure. Right, right. It's little ones are at risk or even some, some um, um, older parents, you know, that could have some health concerns, you know, for whatever it is. You have to minimize that risk buying yeah. first and then selling later. Um, or also, you're ready to move forward, but you just haven't gotten the home right. You still have a project to do or you want to get ready for the listing and your dream home pops up and they're not going to take a contingency. You have to act. Otherwise, you're going to lose out on it. That happens quite a bit. Also, so, finally, nope, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go no, ahead. I mean, all these different scenarios. And then, of course, the retirement aspect of it, too. You know, that they the uh, market has uh, presented itself that great opportunity for you to buy. But you may not even be ready right now for retirement. Let's say you want to move from Lincolnwood to River North, and this is where you're going to be retiring and downsizing and living out of a condo from the house to the backyard. And it's the right. perfect spot. It's right next to your, your the people, your good friends. They're in the same building. It's perfect. You're just not ready. So you buy, and now you may not sell for another year or two after, after the fact. So there are all different types of of scenarios and situations, why you would be wanting to explore these options. There's a lot of products and programs available. It's just, So that's where I was going to ask you next. So it's not like you have to just do a straight up buy one, buy a second one with the, you know, just conventional mortgage. Now I have two. You have some options for people yeah. to consider, right? Yeah. And there, there, I was, there's not one size that fits all because they're also different. Um, we can use bridge financing, right? So ideally, you know that you're going to sell probably just within a few months after you buy. And if you have the equity available, bridge financing is available. But right now, I mean, it's it's a market in the, in the mortgage industry that's felt a little bit of pressure because of what's going on with the economy. It's that type of loan that, that can be very sensitive to that. But it's available right now. Uh, during the Great Recession, 
bridge financing was not existent. Today it is existent. It's just a little bit sensitive right now. Okay. Um, but also to, you know, harnessing and using creative financing, right? Uh, the biggest one is um, you, you know you're going to be expecting a net of, let's say, $200,000 from your home sale six, seven, eight months after you buy. Um, you don't necessarily want to drain your accounts for the down payment on the purchase. You could put down a lower down payment. You can do that, absolutely. But we can use, let's say, two mortgages, a primary mortgage on a 30-year fix for 70% financing and a second mortgage for 20% financing, and you put 10% down. And then when you do sell, you take the 200000 or whatever the proceeds are, and you just pay off that second mortgage. It's like having your cake and eating it too. Uh-huh. Um, there's a and lot then you've of got a credit line, right? And then you have a credit line. So that's actually interesting too. Not only that, but now you have a credit line that you can draw, repay, draw, repay for multiple years. Um, there's also other, there's old new things. And I say that because it's great that they came back called recasting. Recasting to simplify is just hitting the reset button on a mortgage. So let's say you open up a mortgage for 500000 and then you make a principal reduction on that 30-year fixed mortgage of 500000 of $100,000 on a standard loan. What usually ends up happening is you just end that loan sooner. Payment doesn't change, you just end it sooner. Well, recasting allows you for a small fee after you make that large, let's say $100,000 principal reduction, pay $400 or so, hit the reset button, start a whole new 30 year term over again, and the payment adjusts accordingly to the new balance. It's like refinancing without really needing to refinance. Do the whole thing. Right, yeah. right. Especially if interest rates move higher, which is an entirely different webinar, uh, but <laughs> yeah, entirely different one. If right. they do, you know, banking on, oh, I'll refinance. Well, what if rates are higher? Recasting is right. a great option to consider. All right. So in other words, if somebody really wants to do this option, mm -hmm. and, well, well, you know, and, and there are options. And you said too, that you could even pull from 401ks, borrow off of 401ks or do all kinds of things, right? So there is so many different, yes, gifts, 401ks, borrowing against stocks is another, is another asset backed type of loan. Um, and it's kind of interesting when you borrow from your own assets, it's not really considered a liability in the eyes of the lender. You're borrowing for what you already own. Um, now it's different if you're borrowing from somebody else or, you know, that's a different story. If you're borrowing from 401k or stocks or you know, even taking draws, you're, it's absolutely fine. And including gifts as well as home equity lines of credit or bridge loans from other properties that you may own. There's a lot that can be used. Even loans against from businesses in some cases could be used. Oh, okay. um, as long as we bake that into the affordability. Um, a lot of options to consider. It's just- again, So you're saying that there are lots of ways we can make this happen. So <laughs> there's, there's a lot of ways to share. I'm all about options. And okay. sometimes I always say, in order for, for there to be good options, favorable options, sometimes there are just less favorable options. So it's trying to find exactly what fits and what mm -hmm. the, the tolerance for risk is and you know what may seem absolutely acceptable to one person may seem a little bit uh, risky for another. So right. I never assume, I'll lay out all your options and I'll let my, my customer um, decide what fits best for them. That sounds good. All right, so let's go back to our slides. Mm -hmm. We talked to, oh, so here we are. Let's just do a quick summary. Middle of the screen, same time, closing on the same day. The pros are you don't have to do temporary housing. You can do it in one move. You know how much money you have in hand. Now, the downside of that might be that the timing is tricky because you need to sell on time to make it work, and you might be a little less competitive when negotiating on the buy side. On the left side, if you sell first, Lower financial risk, you've got your money in hand, but the perfect home may not be available, so you may have to do the double move after all. And then finally, if you buy first, it gives you a chance to find the perfect home and do one move, but the downside is you might have to hold a couple properties for a while. So, let's talk about avoiding potential pitfalls. 
waiting until the end to get your home ready to sell can be a pitfall because it takes a while to get your stuff ready <laughs> and not having a backup plan. One of the ones I see on here, Vaughn, is the uh, not putting in a cushion. So talk to me about that and how you talk to your clients. Well, you know, making sure you have a cushion, you just want to do that for just about anything that you ever buy, right? Or also bake into what you're selling. You know, as soon as we put a home for sale for, you know, you have an idea of what you think it's going to sell for. Well, what if it doesn't, right? Or what if you want to buy and it ends up being a hot property and it's a situation where, you know, you've got multiple offers, you have, may have to go above the list price, having a cushion there. But also having a cushion for anything just makes sense, especially um, uh, for just, you know, peace of mind and, and uh, just approaching things in a, in a safe and secure way, we'll say, especially nowadays. So, <laughs> exactly yeah, right. I'm a big fan of that. It, it, even though the loan may not necessarily need what's called reserves and things like that, it's always good to have that contingency, that cushion. Right, absolutely. Now, one of the things that our viewers may be a little surprised to hear is that we agree with the recommendation that uh, don't rush to make a purchase decision and consider renting and buying both as options. You know, we do this because we want to help our clients and make the right choice. And this is all about doing the right thing for the right reasons. And so we're trying to make it work. But if renting is the right option, then we would wholeheartedly advocate for that. Um, make sure you can easily afford it too. Uh, I think given our recent COVID-19, I think everybody's going to say amen to that. Um, the other thing people say is don't buy a home for your grandchildren and stop caring what other people think. <laughs> That's a good one. So, um, one of the obstacles to, over, uh, to getting into this right sizing mode is helping with dealing with things. Uh, I just saw a statistic that the average homeowner possesses 300,000 things. Can you believe that number? That blew me away. So um, dealing with those 300,000 things can be overwhelming. And I have to tell you, it's one of the first things that people who are right sizing say to me is I just don't know how to deal with it. And I just don't want anybody to feel like those things are getting in the way of them getting to where they need to go. And it's that, for that reason that we've put together a whole bunch of people, and you talked about attorneys, there are so many more that we can help our clients find to be on their team to make this happen. Uh, being a senior real estate specialist, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, we have all kinds of access, access to resources. Um, there is the National Association of Senior Move Managers, if you can believe such a thing exists, but it does. And I have two amazing people, different companies that I work with, where they come in and they help the clients edit their belongings, maybe move some things into storage stage and help them take care of things from that perspective. And our company, I am really pleased to say, Baird & Warner, has a, an agreement with a terrific company that will come in and let's say you've been in your home for 30 years and you've done the mechanical stuff but you know you put your kids through college you don't want to spend more money in putting in a new kitchen that all these young people want because you want to spend your money elsewhere right well there's this really cool company that will come in do the work on their dime they're the general contractors, they get it all ready for sale, and you pay them back when you sell. And they have so much experience with this that they only put money in in the least expensive way possible to get you the biggest return on investment. And I'm working on one of those right now, and I am beyond excited at how well it is working for my client. So, hmm. I mean, our job, right, Ron, is to remove the obstacles and make it easy for our clients, so. I couldn't agree. Providing solutions to obstacles or no, unknown obstacles, just having them in your back pocket. And that's, that's exactly right. Anticipating problems and taking care of them before they occur. 
All right, dealing with emotions, that's the elephant in the room that we have to address. Um, although once we get to the other side, it feels good, going through the transition isn't always the most fun. In fact, it can be downright awful. And speaking from experience, it, it, you know, it can be challenging at times. So you need to focus on where you're going, the big picture, and list your friends and loved ones and family to help you, and uh, take it one step at a time. But um, it is really great and freeing to be at the place where you've right-sized, the money's right, the home is right, and you're happy. So, Ron, first steps. Somebody's downsizing, what do they do? I, I'm going to say automatically, you got to get through <laughs> Oh no, pre-approved. <laughs> yeah. You gotta, you gotta, there is no reason to delay speaking with a financial advisor, your tax accountant, your loan officer, getting, again, those ducks in a row before you make, a, a, and this is a life change, a life altering decision. So right. a 20 minute conversation with a couple of pay stubs or tax documents or, you know, whatever it may be, could really just pave the way for a very smooth, an enjoyable, really, I'll say an enjoyable um, uh, transition from selling and buying and not having to worry about the loan. So okay. again, get pre-approved early, have that dialogue, have that uh, advisor um, on the, uh, the top five in your, uh, your phone. Absolutely. That's it. Now I'm, I'm, yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. We're beating the drum. Get pre-approved, talk to your agent first. Um, I have a couple of questions in the question box, so I'll bring them up now. One is um, new construction. If somebody is buying new construction and they can't move into it for several months and they're selling, how do they make sure that their buyer is qualified, that they can move forward? Um, and I'll bet you've done this before. Do you do second opinions? Like, oh, can I, you know, if, if somebody says they want to buy my property and I'm not sure of their ability to get to the closing table, you talk to them? Quite a bit. You know, quite a bit, especially in circumstances where there may be some some concerns. Um, I've even, I've even had, you know, situations where a seller has unfortunately whatever reasons just had deal after deal fall through because of the buyers not necessarily because of the home and they had enough and they want to make sure that the next contract that they accept that those buyers truly are pre-approved and mm -hmm. the second opinion on that is is absolutely warranted to curb concerns or you don't want to sell a fourth or fifth right. time. um i do offer that and also second opinions, uh, also just, you know, nobody, I like to think test, you know, you got to test drive a couple of cars before you make a decision uh, and making sure you have the right financing options in place is always warranted. So second opinion can't hurt, but again, getting pre-approved first early on, uh, the mm -hmm. first opinion is where it starts. Right. Absolutely. Um, let's see. I think that covers it. For this evening, any other thoughts before we let everybody go? You know, and I have to say that when you're right sizing, and I love the term of right sizing because it can mean so many different things. It could even, you know, it could even include purchasing what could be now a vacation home for a few years before you sell. It doesn't always have to be that immediate sell and buy, or even within six or seven months, or even setting up, you know, retirement for investment properties. Currently, right. you know, there's uh, a lot of cash people are sitting on because of what happened in the financial markets and investing in hard assets such as real estate is a, definitely something a part of, in my opinion, everyone's portfolio when retiring. It should be at least. So this is all about planning, right sizing, not only just for your space and for your home and for your quality of life, but also for your financial future. And uh, who knows, you know, it could also include some Airbnb in there. It could also include, you know, renting out the home, not selling that you have, renting it out or setting mm -hmm. up a trust. I mean, there's a lot of great things. And it all starts with a conversation with, with, you know, a real estate professional such as yourself, a lender and family. I think family is a big part of it too. 
Absolutely. So just a parting thought on that. I love that. Final question I'm going to answer myself, and that is how soon should I get started in my downsizing planning or my right sizing planning? And I would answer that, that, you know, listen, if you're within the next five years, it's not too soon to have a conversation. You and I talk to people every day who aren't doing anything for a long time, but just want to get some advice. And uh, the situation is fluid, yes, but getting getting some info and starting to think ahead is certainly a great idea when you think. Couldn't agree more. I mean, again, you know, nobody rush, I have to say, I've never, we may all rush to retirement, right? But nobody rushes to retirement at the same time. But still, right. it's all about estate planning, good mortgage planning, life size, you know, uh, growing, expanding families or obviously, you know, empty nests. It, there's a lot of things to consider and it doesn't hurt at all to explore options early and at least set a path. Right, exactly. Love it. That's all we have right now, everybody. Thank you for watching. As I said, we're going to have this on YouTube. Feel free to reach out to us uh, and let us answer all your questions and help you plan for your home that sparks joy as you right size. And thank you in advance for answering the survey after this. Thank you so much and take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Anne. Bye-bye.